Hello everyone, I'm uh, Aidan Casey. Um, I thought I'd just say a few introductory words um, in, before handing over to the um, substantive speakers. I'm sort of going to be more of a bit of a moderator today, but um, just, firstly just to say thank you to everyone for attending and uh, watching. We're pretty well a full service commercial and several chambers. We've got members specialising in all aspects really, commercial, contractual, corporate, insolvency, employment, law and all of the associated um, field. So I'm just going to give you a brief intro um, to each of today's um, substantive speakers and then I'll, I'll hand over to them. I think Tom Poole is going to speak um, first. He's going to speak about service out of the jurisdiction post Brexit. Um, Tom, uh, Tom's practice extends across the full range of commercial disputes, the particular expertise in offshore issues. Uh, he's recognised in the directories as a leading junior in commercial dispute resolution, civil fraud and employment. Um, he's on the AG's A panel, um, and so does some of the government's most high-profile and complex uh, cases. And last year, he acted in, um, to date, the, the UK's longest fully remote uh, trial, a six-week Chancery Division trial called uh, One Blackfriars, <coughs> and no doubt has some stories to tell um, from that. Last but not least, Tom is about to take silk in, in March, so um, uh, congratulations again to him for that. Sara Ibrahim will speak um, next, and she's going to speak about the disclosure pilot scheme. Um, Sara's practice encompasses uh, a mix of employment and general commercial litigation, including uh, professional negligence. She often acts in cases where these claims intersect. So by way of example, where individuals are employees and also directors, um, de jure, de facto, shadow, and, and so on. She regularly appears in the High Court um, in a range of matters, including injunctions, insolvency and general commercial disputes. She's been listed as a leading junior for Prof Neg in Legal 500 for the last five years and uh, often also does cases involving other jurisdictions, uh, including Caribbean and Gibraltar. Ben Channer is going to speak about um, witness statements. Uh, ben has a wide ranging practice advising and representing clients in commercial insolvency, property and contentious probate matters. Uh, and um, uh, exotically, as Crown Counsel, he represented the government of St Helena in the Privy Council, generally found closer to home, appearing before a full range of um, tribunals, masters, ICC and High Court uh, judges. <clears throat> so uh, that, that was just a brief intro about the relevant speakers. So um, with that intro, I'm going to hand over to um, Tom Poole. Thanks. Uh Aidan and afternoon everyone. Let me start by hopefully sharing my screen with you all. Uh, as Aidan said, next 15 minutes or so I'm going to discuss service out of the jurisdiction and what changes we can expect to see to the rules governing service out. Now the good news is I'm not going to mention anything to do with Covid. I'm afraid the bad news is I'm going to mention Brexit and the reason I can't avoid talking about Brexit is that the proposed rule changes are designed to address the problems that those involved in cross-border litigation might face now that the Brexit transition period has come to an end. So let's start by looking at what we need to watch out for this year. On 9th of October last year, the Civil Procedure Rule Committee met and in principle agreed an amendment to the rules governing service out of the jurisdiction after 1st of January this year. The amendment was proposed by the Lord Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Private International Law. Now, in a nutshell, the amendment will remove the need for the court's permission to serve out where an applicant is seeking to rely upon an England and Wales choice of court agreement and where the 2005 Hague Convention does not apply. Now, the minutes of the Rules Committee record that the purpose of the proposed amendment is to reassure the legal profession and wider business community and give businesses the confidence to continue to choose the jurisdiction of the English courts by eliminating a preliminary step which adds cost and delay. And as we'll hopefully see, the proposed amendment will significantly streamline the procedure for serving out of the jurisdiction in circumstances where the defendant has agreed that the courts of England and Wales should have jurisdiction to determine disputes that arise under a contract. The proposed amendment is therefore, in my view, welcome particularly in circumstances where the English courts are facing increased competition for international business in a post-Brexit world. Now, before reminding ourselves what the current rules are, I should briefly, and I promise briefly, say something about Brexit, as it does provide the relevant context to the proposed amendment. Now, as we all know, 
on the 31st of January last year, the UK left the EU under the terms of the withdrawal agreement. Now, the withdrawal agreement was implemented into domestic law, first by the EU Withdrawal Act 2018, and then as amended by the EU Withdrawal Act 2020. The withdrawal agreement established a transition period, which ended on the 31st of December last year. The transition period is referred to in the Withdrawal Act as the implementation period, and the end of that period is referred to somewhat awkwardly as IP completion day. So, what was the position during the implementation period, i.e. between 31st of Jan last year and 31st of December? <clears throat> during the implementation period, EU law continued to apply to and in the UK, unless otherwise provided in the withdrawal agreement. Accordingly, during the implementation period, the rules on jurisdiction and enforcement of judgments under the judgments regulation continue to apply as between the UK and the EU, as did the provisions relating to service and taking of evidence under the service regulation and taking of evidence regulation. The application of these regulations is extended beyond the implementation period by certain transitional provisions contained in the withdrawal agreement, and for anyone interested, the relevant provisions are Articles 67 and 68. The UK also continued to be bound during the implementation period by obligations stemming from international agreements to which the EU is a party. Now, these include international agreements relevant to the service provisions in CPR Part 6, such as the Brussels and Lugano Conventions and the 2005 Hague Convention on Choice of Court Agreements. While the withdrawal agreement contains certain transitional arrangements on these issues, essentially for proceedings started by the end of the implementation period, the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement, agreed on Christmas Eve last year, does not make any longer term provision in these areas. So let's start by looking at how things stood at the end of the implementation period, i.e. as at 31st of December last year. The general rule under CPR 26.31 is that a claim form can be served on the defendant present within the territorial jurisdiction of England and Wales, but not outside that territory. There are, however, exceptions to that rule. In relation to some exceptions, service may be effected outside the jurisdiction only with the permission of the court. In relation to others, no such permission is required. And as set out on the slide, CPR Rule 6.33 is concerned with exceptions to the latter category. And that's going to be our focus this afternoon. Now, at the moment, in broad summary, CPR 6.33 provides that a claimant can serve proceedings on a defendant outside the UK without needing to obtain the court's permission, where the English court has jurisdiction in four different contexts. Under the Civil Jurisdiction and Judgments Acts 1982, or the Lugano Convention, as provided by Rule 6.331, under the Judgments Regulation 6.332, under the 2005 Hague Convention on Choice of Court Agreements, 6.332b, and then finally under other legislation, 6.333. Within each of the third and fourth of these contexts, the court's power to determine claims arises on a single ground, but in the first, it arises on three separate grounds, and in the second, on five. Now, the result of all of that is that under CPR 6.33, a claim form may be served out of the jurisdiction without permission on 10 separate grounds. And as everyone that has made an application to serve out will know, these 10 grounds are set out in separate boxes in Form N510, Service Out of the Jurisdiction, which is the notice that the claimant is required to file and serve where service out of a claim form uh, under 6.33 is intended. Aside from those 10 scenarios, a claimant may be able to obtain the court's permission to serve proceedings out under 6.36. To do so, the claimant must be able to show a good arguable case that the claim falls within one of the common law gateways for service out, as set out in paragraph 3.1 of Practice Direction 6b, that in relation to the foreign defendant to be served with the proceedings, there is a serious issue to be tried on the merits, and that in all circumstances, England and Wales is clearly or distinctly the appropriate forum for the trial of the action, and the court should exercise its discretion to permit service out. So before we consider the post-Brexit position, I should say just a little bit more about the recast Brussels regulation. Now, in general, where parties have agreed that the courts of a particular EU member state should have jurisdiction, that court will have jurisdiction. Unless agreed otherwise, that jurisdiction will be exclusive, meaning no other court will have jurisdiction. 
Now, the recast Brussels regulation addresses the problem that was referred to as the Italian torpedo. That's a tactical manoeuvre whereby a party to an exclusive jurisdiction agreement used to be able to cause delay and inconvenience to their opponent by commencing proceedings in a court other than that specified in the agreement, which under the old rules would have had priority as the court first seized of the dispute. Under the recast Brussels regulation, the non-chosen court must stay its proceedings unless and until the chosen court declares that it does not have jurisdiction. The English courts have held for this purpose an exclusive jurisdiction clause includes an asymmetric clause, common in finance agreements, obliging one party to sit in a particular court while the other may choose. Now, Denmark has a standalone agreement with the EU broadly on the terms of the Brussels recast regulation. The position between EU member states, Iceland, Norway and Switzerland, and until Brexit, the UK, is governed in similar terms by the Lugano Convention. This does not, however, contain the innovations introduced in the Brussels recast regulation, for example, to address the Italian torpedo issue. Now, these rules continue to apply in respect of the UK until the end of the implementation period, so up until 31st of December last year. So let's now consider the position once the Brexit transition period ended. As things stood, where there's a jurisdiction clause in favour of the courts of England and Wales, the recast Brussels regulation will almost invariably apply. And so the claim can ordinarily be served out without the court's permission. However, for proceedings brought after the end of the Brexit transition period, i.e. from 1st of January this year, the recast Brussels regulation and the Brussels and Lugano conventions will no longer apply. Accordingly, all of the bases we've just discussed for serving out without court's permission will be removed from CPR 6.33, unless the UK is able to re-accede to the Lugano Convention, which we'll come on to discuss in a moment. So, if there's no amendment to CPR 6.33, a claimant will need the court's permission to serve proceedings out, even where the parties have agreed that the English court should have jurisdiction over any dispute, unless the agreement falls within the 2005 Hague Convention. Now, the difficulty with this is that the 2005 Hague Convention only applies with the choice of court agreement is exclusive, which, according to the explanatory report to the convention, does not include an asymmetric or unilateral jurisdiction clause. That is, as already mentioned, where one party must bring proceedings in a designated court, but the other party has a choice of where to sue. And self-evidently, it does not include a mutually non-exclusive clause. And further, for the 2005 Hague Convention to apply, the choice of court agreement must have been concluded after its entry into force for the state of the chosen court, which for the UK is 1st of October 2015. There is, however, some uncertainty as to whether EU member states will treat that as the relevant date, for example, in considering whether to enforce an English judgment pursuant to the 2005 Hague Convention. In this regard, um, I note that the European Commission has expressed a view that the 2005 Hague Agreement will apply to exclusive English jurisdiction clauses only if they are concluded after the UK re-exceeds on 1st of January 2021. Okay. However, as we note on the slide, the Private International Law Implementation of Agreements Act, which received royal assent 14th of December last year, provides that for the purposes of the 2005 Hague Convention, the date of entry into the force of the UK is 1st of October 2015. So where does that all leave us? Well, the upshot is that absent a rule change, claimants would need the court's permission to serve proceedings on the defendant out of the jurisdiction, despite that defendant having agreed that the English court should have jurisdiction, unless the choice of court agreement falls within the relatively narrow confines of the 2005 Hague Convention namely exclusive choice of court agreement concluded on or after 1st of October 2015. It's for this reason that the Rules Committee identified the need for the proposed amendment to the service out rules. Now, the Rules Committee minutes record that the amendment will introduce a new rule 6.33 2C. And as already mentioned, the amendment will allow service out without the court's permission where the contract contains a jurisdiction clause in favour of the courts of England and Wales. The amendment was agreed subject to final drafting, so the precise wording of the new rule is not yet available. But, as noted on the slide, the Rules Committee minutes state that the existing common law gateway of contract claims, which fall within such a clause, will at the same time be removed. Now, this gateway is of long standing, but has been largely redundant since the introduction of the recast Brussels regulation in January 2015, which, as we've discussed, applies to choice of court agreements in favour of the English courts, regardless of whether there's any EU domiciled party. Uh, 
As already mentioned, even where none of the bases for serving a claim form out of the jurisdiction without permission apply, the claimant can still seek the court's permission to serve out in certain circumstances. So absent the new rule, permission would very likely be granted where there's a jurisdiction clause in favour of the English courts, assuming the claimant can meet the hurdle of establishing a serious issue to be tried on the merits. It's well established that where parties have bound themselves to an exclusive jurisdiction clause, the English court will normally give effect to it unless there are strong reasons to the contrary. So if a claimant would be likely to obtain permission anyway, does the rule change really matter? Well, in my opinion, the answer to that question is a resounding yes. An application for permission to serve out is a procedural hurdle which involves additional time and cost, even where a favourable result to the applicant may confidently be predicted. So importantly, since the application is invariably made without notice to the defendant at the initial stage, the claimant is also under a duty of full and frank disclosure of any factors which might reasonably be thought to weigh against the application being granted. That requires careful consideration. Removing this hurdle is therefore a significant benefit to a claimant, and it's difficult to see any prejudice to a defendant in circumstances where the jurisdiction of the English courts has already been agreed. As the Rules Committee minutes make clear, and as you'd expect, the defendant will still be able to challenge the court's jurisdiction after the proceedings are served. For instance, if it wishes to argue that there's no valid jurisdiction agreement. And equally, a defendant can apply to strike out the claim or for make an application for reverse summary judgment if it considers the claim has no real prospect of success. So overall, the general consensus is that the rule change is welcome. Now, before we conclude, I just want to briefly consider what the position would be if the UK rejoined Lugano. Now, the UK submitted its application to re-accede to the Lugano Convention on the 8th of April last year. The UK previously announced in January of last year that it had received statements of support from Norway, Iceland and Switzerland, but agreement is also required from the EU and also Denmark. The position of the EU member states remains somewhat uncertain. Now, although the fact the EU trade and cooperation agreement was agreed uh, at the end of last year may mean it's now more likely that the EU will give its agreement to the UK rejoining Lugano, there are no guarantees. If the UK does rejoin, then jurisdiction clauses in favour of the English court will fall within that convention where there is at least one party domiciled in a Lugano contracting state. In those circumstances, there would be no need for permission to serve out with or without the further rule change. But the new rule will remain relevant and I suggest welcome where the contracting parties are domiciled elsewhere and where the case falls outside the 2005 convention. So the takeaway from all of this is Perhaps watch this space and look out in the coming weeks for the amendment to CPR uh, rule 6.33 and potentially the UK rejoining Lugano. I'll now uh, attempt to stop sharing my screen and I will hand over to Ben, who is going to talk to you about witness statements. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, yes, so I'm going to give a roundup of the 2020 developments on witness statements. Um, the changes that, have, that came around last year and then what we can expect to see uh, coming into force this year. So starting with what we saw last year, I think the first point is one we're all likely to be very familiar with. Um, and it's the bolstering of the statements of truth that came in on the 6th of April uh, last year, an amendment to part 22 um, with the addition of, I understand, that proceedings for contempt of court may be brought against anyone who makes or causes to be made a false statement in a document verified by a statement of truth without an honest belief in its truth. That rather wordy um, addition is fairly obvious in its reasoning and it's really to hammer home the importance of factual contents of witnesses, uh, witness statements being truthful. Um, one might have thought fairly self-evident, uh, particularly amongst practitioners, as to the importance of that. Um, but the need for it follows on from a number of relatively high profile cases, um, particularly a relatively interesting one I've, I've set out in the slide there, Liverpool, Victoria um, and Dr. Safar. Uh, Dr. Safar was a uh, medical expert instructed in a relatively low value RTA. Uh, he wrote a, an initial report that his uh, solicitor wasn't happy with and then invited him or I, I suppose told him to make amendments to that, um, making the claimant's injuries far worse and therefore far more uh, valuable, uh, which he did seemingly without question. And this only came to light rather comically uh, 
um, when both versions of his reports were included in the trial bundle. Um, and surprisingly, he was committed for contempt, uh, the Court of Appeal, um, whilst highlighting that a suspended sentence wasn't duly lenient, uh, reiterated uh, that the doctor had no regard uh, for the contents of the report um, as to its truthfulness. So that is one of the cases that gave rise to the, the bolstering uh, of the wording of the statement of truth uh, that we saw last year. The other matters we saw coming in, alterations to part 22, were the addition of the requirement for the statement to be in the witness's own language um, and dated on the day it was made, so all fairly um, common sense. Um, as were the additions we saw to part 32 and the practice direction to it um, concerning evidence that came in, into force on the same date, uh, 6th of April 2020 last year. Um, the body of the witness statement must contain details as to the process by which it has been prepared. That's whether it's face to face over the phone or through correspondence. Um, it must also be in the witness's own words and in the witness's own language. Now, these, I think, again, perhaps fairly obviously, are to move away from the position we frequently see, which is the over lawyering of witness statements um, and perhaps help practitioners in those awkward moments where we get a witness that says, well, I don't know, my, my solicitor wrote it or I just signed it. It's a, it's a move to reiterate uh, that the witness statement must be the way. We also get fairly reciprocal um, arrangements in relation to the ones I just read out in relation to the statement of truth, uh, where a witness is in a foreign party relying on it must have it translated, uh, filing both that and the foreign language witness statement with the court. Um, a requirement also for the translator to sign um, a certificate uh, of accuracy and for the date of the translation to be set out um, uh, as well. All fairly common sense um, additions. What then did we see last year in relation to commentary or changes in relation to the actual content of witness statements themselves? I've set out here the fairly well established commentary in the White Book. 32.4.5, um, which is very disparaging um, and reflecting perhaps the, the, the position that's existed for, for a particular amount of time. Um, you can see there it says, unfortunately, rules, practice directions and guidance as to the contents of witness statements appeal to be habitually ignored by practitioners. Uh, periodically, the Court of Appeal and individual trial judges have criticised criticized lawyers for overloading witness statements with material that should not be included. That perhaps gives you a flavour as to how um, witness statements were, or the, the difficulties with witness statements in their context have been regarded um, in years gone by. Um, but last year did see some fairly interesting examples, um, direct criticism and guidance in relation to that precise point that the White Book alludes to. I've taken as the first example there the case of Scatterfort Valt Ningen, which I'm entirely sure is not how it's pronounced, um, and Solo Capital Partners LLP. Um, it's fairly self-explanatory as to what the judge's criticisms were, the slightly off-handed, um, almost snide remarks, to, to reiterate the points made in relation to the content and length of the statements. Um, stating the parties have therefore expended the time and effort at no doubt very considerable cost to argue the summary judgment application twice over, once in writing through the solicitor's witness statements, then again at the hearing. I find it impossible to identify what purpose it was thought might be served by arguing the application out through the witness statement. Now, I think it's worth pointing out, as, as that quote states, this was in relation to a summary judgment application. And the sorry, I'm just getting a sign saying oh, bad network quality, but hopefully everyone can still still hear me. Um, this related to a summary judgment application, and I think the commentary there is perhaps a little unfair because we've all been in the position, I'm sure, of having witness statements for interim applications, uh, setting out the relevant test for summary judgment or whether it's the three stage test in Denton. Um, and I find for a witness statement to be framed in, in that way, um, directly relating the facts to the law and therefore having to, in a, in a sense, argue 
um, argued the position as opposed to simply set out the facts can be useful both for pre presenting the application um, and also for, for the judge in deciding it. So I think um, judge here perhaps going, making slightly unrealistic comments as to what should be presented in, in witness statements uh, in relation to interim applications. Um, that said, in relation to substantive matters of, of fact, um, we can see from these two quotes that I've taken here, YJB Port Limited and MA Pharmachem Limited, um, another fairly disparaging uh, quote in relation to the only witness of fact called by a defendant qualified solicitor. Uh, his witness statement ran to 69 pages and contained a great deal of analysis, submission and commentary on documents. In terms of meaningful factual evidence, Mr Miller had little to contribute. Not really the position um, we want to be in or judicial comment we, we want passed. Um, similarly, Sevis and Frawley and another, um, a further observation, so this is obviously not, not material, but the judge felt the need to mention it anyway. A further observation does not reflect adverse on Mr Frawley, but on whoever was responsible for drafting his witness statement. It was 22 pages long, comprised 111 paragraphs and contained a great deal of comment and commentary that has no proper place in a witness statement. Witness statements are for the giving of evidence, not for arguing the case, making points against the opponent or providing commentary on documents. So again, some, some fairly harsh judicial comments there about what should or rather shouldn't be in a witness statement. Which brings me neatly on to the changes for 2021, um, following on from those comments and addressing them directly. The, the biggest change that we're going to see this year in witness evidence albeit at this stage limited to the business and property courts, and even then only in relation to witness statements uh, of fact for trial, um, is the long awaited outcome of the witness evidence working report group, um, which came out on the 6th of December 2019. They then followed an implementation report on 31st of July 2020 um, and an addendum report on the 19th of October. And the purpose of this uh, was to consider what reforms um, in relation to witness evidence would be useful. Um, and it stemmed from an impression shared by a substantial majority of the judges of the commercial court that factual witness statements were often ineffective in performing their core function of achieving best evidence at proportionate cost in commercial court trials. So faced with this potential issue, the group consulted widely amongst the profession uh, sending out a survey and amongst the respondents there were a number of views. Um, chiefly amongst those were that the current approach does not always achieve the best evidence because statements are often over-engineered and end up not being in the witness's own words. Uh, factual witness statements are also considered frequently to stray into areas beyond the actual knowledge of the witness in an effort to bring documents um, or on occasion irrelevant information into the factual matrix of the case. And what I think is a particularly good point um, mentioned was that the effectiveness of witness statements is often overstated as cross examiners feel they must cover a large amount of ground based on the statement, which lengthens the time required for cross examination, thereby lengthening the required trial time. Uh, and then finally, there was the widespread view amongst the profession that the existing rules on witness evidence were not sufficiently uh, enforced. This resulted in the report coming out and initially what it set forward were a number of recommendations. Um, the first was in respect of the formulation and, and wide dissemination of a statement of best practice based on the findings of the report. Um, I think the purpose of that really to, to reiterate the, the need of the report, the need for change um, and what that represented. Uh, number two, a further highlighting and alteration to statements of truth um, and the addition of certificates of compliance. Um, this had the objective of reiterating that a witness was fully aware of what was required of them when providing a witness statement in terms of the content and, and that had been explained to them. And then this quite significant um, uh, addition of a certificate of compliance, which the solicitor um, would be responsible uh, for signing once the witness statement had been drafted. I should say a point I perhaps missed there, as you'll see from these recommendations, they're relatively conservative. Um, although they make, in, in, in my view, welcome um, additions, they are not, uh, they don't represent wholehearted reform. 
um, and there was little appetite for radical reform. Some of the ideas initially floated at the beginning, at least, were in relation to US style depositions, disclosure of witness evidence summaries um, with oral examination in chief, and the perhaps most significantly, the possible lifting of privilege uh, in relation to the production of witness statements and disclosure um, of drafts and all communications with witnesses. And one can only imagine the amount of additional documentation and disclosure issues um, and privilege issues uh, that would uh, have created. But thankfully, we're not in that position. We're with the formulation of best practice and additions of statements and certificates of compliance. One relatively unusual um, suggestion that was put forward as a recommendation was that the production of pre-trial pre statements of fact. These were to be in addition to witness statements um, and it seems to me potentially duplicative um, of what these statements are going to be in, uh, what's going to be in the statements. But the intention was that by identifying the state, the, the facts that would go into this, the statements ultimately at an early stage, it would limit the extent of witness evidence simply to what a witness could actually speak to. Uh, number four, examination in chief. There was a reviewing by the group that produced the report of the purpose of examination in chief um, and the highlighting that it should be retained. Um, that there should be the retention of the option for oral examination in chief um, to be considered as an early pretrial stage the CCMC, for instance, um, in relation to specific topics where that would be of use. Uh, mirroring the suggestions from the profession. There was also consideration of enforcement. Um, statement that extensions for the length of witness evidence should be rare um, and there was increased criticism or should be increased criticism uh, and use of cost san sanctions for breach of the practice directions uh, or the court guides. And importantly, I think that this criticism should be at a PTR stage um, as well as after trial when there's consideration of costs. Uh, finally, there was thought to the court guide harmonisation um, so that rather than having the chancery guide, the commercial guide um, uh, and, and various different guides, that there should be a general rule on content and form of statements um, that they should be, um, they, they should all be common across various jurisdictions. Practically then, where have we ended up with, with these developments uh, this year? We have uh, very recently had the report or the recommendations of it essentially approved by way of the Rules Committee um, approving a new practice direction 57 AC um, and an appendix. This is likely to be implemented on the 6th of April uh, this year. Now we have a draft of the practice direction and the appendix. As I say, it's been approved now, so we can take it as read, I think, that this is how it will appear uh, on the 6th of April. There's a change to the content of witness statements for trial, as I've set out there, uh, practice direction 57 AC paragraphs two to three, um, is a uh, reminder that witness evidence for trial must only contain matters of fact that need to be proved at trial, that the witness would be allowed to give an examination in chief that they can personally recollect, and they must identify documents uh, they have been referred to or they refer to in their evidence. The practice direction also boils down to a point in relation to a further amendment in respect of the statement of truth. Um, now, whilst this, I suspect, will become, as with a lot of matters, uh, a case of cut and paste, uh, it's worth looking at what the actual statement of truth adds, because it's quite significant. It's very um, wordy and rather unpoetically written. Um, so as well as the reference to contempt, we're also going to have to have for um, BPC matters. Uh, I have read, or if applicable, have had read to me and understand paragraphs two and three of the practice direction 57 AC, paragraphs 1.3, 2.2 to 2.6, and 3.2 to 3.7 of the appendix to that practice direction in relation to the purpose and proper content of trial witness statements and proper practice in relation to their preparation. Uh, in incredibly wordy and on its own not that helpful unless we have to hand also the practice direction and the appendix to it. So I think it's worthwhile at this point just to remind ourselves or um, look over what the appendix states and 
it can be summarised, I think, from having read it, that it is a, it's a narrative reiteration of the Gessman principles. Um, so it's, it's quite unusual in terms of a practice direction because it's written in, in um, fairly unlegal like language. It states that the human memory is not a fixed record of a witnessed events, but a fluid and malleable state of perception vulnerable to influences. And presumably, once a witness has read this, what they are, uh, the Rules Committee hope is what they will take home from that um, is that simply because you remember something it doesn't necessarily mean it is the truth and you've had that explained to you and you appreciate that during the drafting of your witness statement. Uh, whether or not that materialises into any useful practical um, uh, um, method or uh, application at trial, then I think we shall see, but I'm somewhat dubious. I mentioned about the certificate of compliance that is set out um, in the second point you can see on the slide there, um, and it's for the legal representative to sign again a relatively wordy certification um, in relation to what has been read out um, to the witness providing the statement um, and that they have complied uh, with all the various directions we can see there, the new direction, uh, also paragraphs um, 18.1, 18.2 of practice direction 32. So it really is an, an all-encompassing certificate of compliance to, to really, again, hammer home uh, that a witness has to the best that is possible um, being reminded of what is required when giving evidence. Uh, and, and finally, we can see in practice direction 57 AC uh, 6, um, that there is a reminder within it of the extent of the sanctions that can be um, imposed for breach um, of the practice direction or of any rule. Uh, the court may prevent a party relying on all or part of a witness statement, um, may require that it be redrafted in a compliant manner, or may make a cost of, um, an adverse cost order um, and or order witness statement to give some of or all of their evidence in chief orally. So not necessarily adding to the uh, sanctions available, but reiterating what the court has at its discretion uh, to imply, uh, to, to apply rather. Um, now, I don't know if anybody reads Civil Litigation Brief, um, the, the blog, but it is really quite, quite useful. Um, and I thought I would end with a comment that Gordon Exel, who writes it, um, sets out in relation to all this, um, in relation to the changes. He says, my own view, incidentally, is that uh, if those preparing witness statements knew and followed the rules and practice directions in relation to the drafting of statements and learned a modicum about evidence. Uh, sorry, I think that's my uh, uh, Amazon delivery. Um, my, my own view, incidentally, is that if those preparing witness statements knew and followed the rules and practice directions in relation to the drafting of statements and learned a modicum about evidence, in particular the misuse of opinion evidence, 95% of the difficulties with drafting statements could be avoided. Now, I think that's perhaps living in something of an ideal world, um, and that being the case, there'd be no need for, for any of the new practice direction. Uh, but in my view, it is wordy, it is lengthy, um, it is something we'll, we'll have to get used to for dealing with business and property court matters um, at trial. Um, but it is useful and reminds us as to what a witness statement should contain. Um, and I suspect this, if not um, in the immediate future, but may, may well set the scene for more wide stream uh, changes that we can see um, in relation to the content of witness statements and the rules relating to them uh, across the board. So with that, I'm going to hopefully stop sharing my screen and pass over to Sarah, who will be talking about disclosure. Thank you very much, Ben. I am now going to start talking to you about what may be one of your favourite topics, and that is the disclosure pilot scheme. Now, most of you will be aware that the disclosure pilot scheme uh, was initially contemplated as early as 2016, and it was intended to address concerns around proportionality, cost and efficiency. So it operates in the business and property courts and is mandatory with some very limited exceptions. Originally, it was scheduled to run only for two years. And at the time of this talk, 
would have been finished, but rather with the flavour of the year, it has been extended. So it's extended now until 31st of December 2021. And in light of that, I thought it may be helpful for you all if I did a quick refresher and address some of the cases which have cropped up over the last year or so. So the disclosure pilot scheme is set out in practice direction 51U. It introduced uh, some new concepts, the first one being initial disclosure, and those paragraph references are paragraph references to the practice direction. You'll also be aware it introduced a new disclosure review document. So that replaced the electronic documents questionnaire or the disclosure report. Very importantly, paragraph 10 of the practice direction sets out that parties are expected to cooperate and constructively to engage in the process. Thirdly, it introduced extended disclosure. And those of you who have done disclosure on the pilot scheme will be aware of the new disclosure models, A to E, um, with model A being confined to what is known as known adverse documents, um, moving through, say, C, which was seen as rather middle way or request led um, extended disclosure, all the way up to E, which is used for exceptional cases and things such as fraud. I should just comment here that the obligation to preserve documents is triggered when a person or party knows that it may become a party to proceedings. And that's in paragraph 3.1 of the practice direction. And that extends to taking reasonable steps so agents or third parties do not delete or destroy documents that may be relevant to an issue in proceedings. Now, this has caused some concern because obviously it does encompass relevant employees and former employees as well. So the duty to cooperate, what does that mean? It has been considered recently in the case of AHA pharmaceuticals and jutes, and I've got that on the slide. Now that's cited with approval, the McPartland case, now, what McPartland said is the disclosure pilot is built on cooperation, as its terms make clear. And it went on to say in, in McPartland that cooperation between legal advisers is imperative. The disclosure pilot must not be used as an opportunity for litigation advantage. If that is attempted, the parties responsible will face serious adverse cost consequences. Now, in the AHA case, there was actually specific criticism of the claimants. In that case, they had been engaging in correspondence about disclosure issues and had got to the state where they expressly said in correspondence they refused to correspond with the defendants on disclosure issues anymore. Now, that meant that uh, the parties ended up um, in court. And the court made it very clear that if no progress was possible uh, between the parties, then you have to go back and ask for the court's guidance at a disclosure guidance hearing. Given that the duty to cooperate is built into the pilot scheme, they again were reminded that if those duties were ignored, there were going to be the adverse cost consequences that had been um, cited in the Parliament. What does guidance um, or what guidance had been provided in AHA? Well, there are three points I think are, are particularly useful when it comes to disclosure. The first one is that they discourage you from using generic keyword for all issues. So the parties really do need to apply their mind as to what keywords may be relevant on the discrete issues. Secondly, you are encouraged to cooperate by using, where possible, face-to-face -face, um, engagement with the other side rather than correspondence. And I note during this period of COVID and lockdowns, there is a, a reference to weekly phone calls, but you can use um, technology to facilitate dialogue and that will be encouraged by the courts. Thirdly, there ought to be a willingness to share on information and to try what the court terms reasonable proposals. What is meant by this is that not all proposals are going to be perfect 
And this emphasis on disclosure being a process really does mean that, that the parties ought to engage properly and decide what may work and to try it um, and where possible uh, to perfect it as they go on. So there's been a, another uh, interesting case again from last year, which is the Revenue and Customs Commissioner's case. And this was uh, a decision of James Pickering QC, who was sitting as a Deputy High Court judge. This case considered um, the paragraph 18 of the practice direction, which you will know better as being the one governing extended disclosure. Now that uh, particular matter was an initial or followed on from an initial CMC where extended disclosure under paragraph 18 had been ordered. Um, and there was then an appeal of what was the deputy master's decision on, on two main issues. The first was that there could be no order for extended disclosure unless and until there was a list of issues for disclosure. And secondly, the issues in the list of issues for disclosure must be identifiable within the statements of case. And that's something parties have got um, somewhat tied up in knots in some of the other cases. So what are the issues for disclosure? So issues for disclosure are covered in paragraph 7.3 of the practice direction. Now, there had been an earlier decision in Lone Star Communications, which is there on the slide. But in this case, uh, the, the Revenue and Customs case, there was actually a different decision reached. And at paragraph 57 of the judgment, it said, in my judgment, a similar approach can and ought to be adopted towards paragraph 7.3 of the pilot, which, as explained above, defines issues for disclosure as only those key issues in dispute which the parties consider will need to be determined by the court with some reference to contemporaneous documents in order for there to be a fair resolution of the proceedings. In short, in my judgment, in order to be an issue for disclosure for the purposes of paragraph 7.3, it is not necessary for the issue to be ident identifiable on the face of the statements of case. Instead, it is enough for that issue to be something which will need to be determined. Um, and that is, I think, very useful there because there can be quite a few uh, questions or time taken up by the parties determining what the issues for disclosure actually are. So for my money's worth, I would say that this decision is perhaps um, more useful than that that was set out in Lone Star. Just moving on to the, the varying of extended disclosure orders, there are key factors and those are set out usefully in paragraph 6.4 of the pilot. Some of these will be very familiar from other uh, practice directions. For example, the nature and complexity of issues in proceedings, the importance of any non-monetary relief sought, whether something has probative value in supporting or undermining a claim or defence, the number of documents involved, the financial positions of the respective parties, the ease and expense of searching for and retrieval of any particular documents, and finally, the need to ensure the case is dealt with expeditiously, fairly, and at a proportionate cost. So moving on to the update on the disclosure pilot scheme. So the chair of uh, the working group published an update, including details of proposed changes, which were sent to the Civil Procedure Rules Committee. Now, interestingly, at this um, updated working group, they considered the report, which some of you may have cast your eye over, and that is the Mulheran report. Now, this report is dated 25th of February last year, but actually relates to feedback from October, November 2019, when the pilot had only um, been established for just shy of a year. If you remember my opening remarks about the intention behind this pilot, you will then see it is pretty damning at this stage what the report says. 
vast majority of people in the responses received said the pilot had not saved costs. Uh, similarly, they say it had in fact increased burdens on the court and just shy of 80% said it had not brought about a culture change. So the question here is, are these merely teething issues or are they um, more serious? In view of those responses, we have had um, some updates and what will be some welcome, I suspect, proposed changes. I've just touched upon three or four of them, uh, but I just wanted to talk through some of these. The first one is about clarifying what is meant by known adverse documents and particularly when does the obligation um, kick in uh, to provide known adverse documents. There was some concern that it would bite as early as either initial disclosure or issue of proceedings. Um, this will now be clarified to say it doesn't happen until extended disclosure is to be provided. Uh, similarly, document preservation orders were seen to be very all encompassing and something um, a lot of people were concerned with. It's now been or will be clarified that it is only when reasonable belief that a relevant or former employee has a disclosable document that is not already in the possession of the party to the litigation. And that, I think, will be very helpful. Uh, finally, I just want to touch on Model C disclosure, which being the middle of all of the extended disclosure options, came a kind of default favourite for a lot of parties. So there has been um, or will be some proper guidance on that. You will be, I'm sure, aware that some people, when they were looking at the disclosure of particular documents um, or a narrow class of documents related to a particular issue for disclosure, were actually following the models used in international arbitration or uh, what's more typically referred to as Redfern schedules. But now uh, the view which has been adopted by the High Court previously in the Papiba versus BG group case is going to say that is more appropriate, which means it will be more narrow and one would hope less costly and more proportionate. So we are still at a stage where uh, this disclosure uh, pilot process is ongoing and one would hope to see that it will start to adhere to its aims and um, that it, it will become less costly um, and less burdensome for the parties. So I'm going to hand back to Aidan. Well, um, thank you to our, to our speakers. I think that was all uh, very enlightening and um, uh, very useful. We've had